Yes.
Amen. We three kings, they followed the star, they found the Lord, and then they knelt down and they worshiped him. That's what we've come today, to worship Jesus. Let's stand and sing. It's Christmas. Merry Christmas to you. And glory to God in the high. Good morning, Southside Baptist Church, friends and guests of Southside. It is so good to see each and every one of you here today worshiping the Lord Jesus. This is the final Sunday before Christmas as we celebrate the birth of our Messiah. And it's going to be a really, really good day today. We've got some new things. We've got some different things that are taking place. Real quick, one time, how about these folks right here? Thank them once again. 
We, uh, we have got so much to do, so let's go ahead and let's get down to doing it here this morning. Uh, we have had a pretty challenging year, haven't we? It's been a very, very difficult year, but there have been just moments of goodness in it. And uh, what we're going to do today, we're going to take a moment, we're going to celebrate uh, some goodness. So I would like to ask uh, Brantley Boone and his family to come on up and join me on stage. I would like to ask Day, uh, Tatum Dillingham, their family. I would like to ask Brinley uh, Fawn and uh, her family. I would like to ask Mila Lynn Oliver and her family. And uh, let's see, Paisley Puckett and her family. Come on up and join me on stage here for just a second because, as I said, we have got some really, really good things to celebrate. You all come on down. I've got a system, so if y'all could kind of help me stick with it, I'd appreciate it, all right? Uh, there has been so much to take place this year. There's been a lot of loss to take place this year. But we are here today to celebrate gain. While there has been much talk of death, today we're celebrating birth. And we are dedicating five children, as well as their families, to the Lord and to the work of the ministry. We have, for all of these precious young people, a New Testament. We have a certificate of dedication. And I have written a letter to each of these children. And the letter is all the same. They're all getting the same letter. The only thing different uh, is, of course, the name. I'm going to read this letter today. And Lord willing, we're going to read this letter again at a time in the future. The letter says this, Dear Brantley, on December 20th, 2020, your mother and father held you on stage with other small children at Southside Baptist Church. The church family watched with smiles on their faces as we presented you with a New Testament and a certificate of dedication. On, the, on that day, we prayed for you and your parents. We prayed that you would grow, that you would be healthy, and most of all, that you would follow Jesus all the days of your life. We prayed for ourselves. We prayed that we as a church would always be there for you, always working to help you grow in the faith and be a positive Christ-like example for you. We also prayed for today, the day in which you stand yet again before the congregation of Southside Baptist Church, giving testimony through your baptism that those prayers were answered. Way back then, we prayed and thanked God for your birth, and on this day, we pray and thank God that through Christ, you have been born again. We thank God for his work of salvation in your life, and we thank God we are able to celebrate with you this day. We as a congregation recommit ourselves to helping you grow in godliness and in your love for the Lord Jesus. May the Lord bless you, Brantley. Your family and your church family love you very much. So we're going to pray today that for all of these kids, we get to read this letter again on the day that we celebrate their baptism after he or she has received Christ as Lord and Savior. So today is not just a day of dedication. It's not just a day of celebration. Today is a day of faith. We, we praise God that they have been born, and we are going to trust that we will be praising God that they have been born again. So this is the responsibility given to us, not only as family, but also as church family. So with Brantley today are James and Marion Boone. With Tatum. Tatum Dillingham is Ben and Holly Dillingham. With Brinley, Fawn is Eric and Ty Fawn. With 
Mila, I'm saying that right. It's Mila, right? Okay. All right. With Mila Lynn Oliver is Jesse and Emily Oliver. And with Paisley Puckett is Bobby and Ashley Puckett. Church, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, we give you praise this day. We praise you for these children. We praise you for their families. And Father, we pray that these kids would grow, that they would be healthy, that their parents would be blessed with wisdom and discernment in raising them right and nurturing them all the days of their life. And Father, we pray for their salvation. We are trusting you, Lord, that when that day comes, these children would call upon the name of your son, Jesus, and be saved. Father, I thank you for Southside Baptist Church and the church that they are born into. Father, may we as individuals always strive daily to show Jesus to these young people. Father, with great blessing comes great responsibility. And may we rise to the task. There are people in the congregation who will be their Sunday school teachers, who will be their Awana leaders, who will be their youth and children's workers, VBS teachers, people who will chaperone trips. Father, I pray that we always be salt and light to these kids. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Bless us now. In Christ's name we pray. And Southside Baptist Church, if you agree with this prayer, would you say amen? Amen. 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 Let's give the Lord a round of applause today. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to continue to stand and sing in just a second. Remember, it is also at the conclusion of service, it is also Lord's Supper here at Southside Baptist. So uh, we trust that you picked up one of these little handy dandy, I call them communion kits. And uh, if you didn't, they're back there by that door or they're also back here by this door as well as we're singing. Feel free if you need one to go and get one. But that will be at the conclusion of the service. Let's stand. Let's continue to celebrate Jesus today. Celebrate joy to the world.
joy he's given us, all because of that silent night when our Savior was born. There's no real denying it. Christmas is going to inevitably look different this year. Even if we try to make it look and feel the same, it's just going to be different. But one thing is not going to be different. I, I, I kind of got to thinking about this earlier this week, and I just tried to do a little bit of research, and here's what I found. This year, 2020, Americans are going to spend over $1 trillion with a T, trillion dollars on Christmas. U.S. consumers tell Gallup pollsters they plan to spend on average $942 on Christmas gifts this year. That's actually 57 more dollars than last year. More than a third say their gift buying will top $1,000 and that is one-third higher than last year's top spenders. So while it seems Christmas may be on decline this year, 
spending for Christmas is actually going up. Today, all over the world, more than 2 billion people in 160 different countries consider Christmas to be the most important holiday of the year. So everything that we've been talking about these past few weeks, every year, this time of year in church, the thing that we focus on, the stuff that we decorate for this holiday, this Christmas season, has a far-reaching effect on literally billions of people. So what we're going to do today, we're going to conclude our Christmas sermon series this morning by looking together at the subject, the Christmas effect. Because just as Christmas affects so many people every single year, in God's Word, the first Christmas had a pretty resounding effect on a few key people. We're going to be in the Gospel of Luke this morning, chapter 2, verse 8, and we're going to be looking down through verse 20. So we've got about 12 or 13 verses of Scripture to read as we seek to explore together the Christmas effect. Luke chapter 2, verse 8, listen to the word of Christ. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem. And see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds had told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had seen as had been told to them. What I want us to do this morning, I want us to look not just at the people mentioned in this text, but I want us to pay particular attention to some of the words spoken to the shepherds by the angel. Because the angel makes a declaration that would literally rock their world and literally rock the entire world for the years to come. So what we're going to do this morning, we're going to take these 13 or verses or so, and we're going to look at three different things that we can find from this scripture. Three things that we see regarding the effect that Christmas has. The first thing that we need to see is this. Number one, there is good news. Now go back real quick and look at verse 10 through 11. Look at what the angel says. The angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So the shepherds are told in no unequivocal terms, the shepherds are explained to, look, I have good news for you. And the good news is that a Savior has been born today. A Savior has been born. Now, understand something. Where we're sitting and when we're sitting, we have a pretty good hold on what this verse says, on the Savior part of the verse. Like, immediately, we know who and what the angel is talking about that. 
is talking about there. So what we need to understand, though, is that the term Savior, it's a good thing, but it can be a broad thing. Think about it. We use the term Savior a lot. I mean, if you were drowning and someone saves you, you would say, man, you're my Savior. Like, you saved me. Being a Savior is always a good thing. But in this text, it is talking about a very particular thing. The angels have really been cluing us in all along to who Jesus is. Go back to what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. Listen to what the angel says to Joseph. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The news that we get from the angel to the shepherd is not just that the Savior has been born, but the news we get from the angel is that he is a Savior saving us from our sins. If you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you read the events, the words of Jesus' life, here's what you're going to find. He doesn't deal with all of our problems. The world when Jesus left still had the same amount of problems in it. And let's face it, 2,000 years later, the world that Jesus left still has the same amount of problems in it. Jesus did not come to deal with all of our problems. But he did come to deal with our biggest problems. You see, the biggest problem any of us have, I don't care if it's 2020 or any other year, the biggest problem any of us have is the problem of sin. And I want you to think about something real quick this morning. Think of a problem, any problem. I don't care what the problem is. Think of that problem. And I promise you, if you think hard enough, and if you think far back enough, you're going to find at the root of that problem a sin. Sin somewhere is the contributing problem to every other problem we have. Doesn't matter what it is, the root problem all of us face is sin. And the Bible says that a Savior has been born and the child that was born would save his people from their sins. Think about it. Sin is our biggest problem, not just because it affects and births all other problems, but sin is a problem that carries on even after we die. Think about what the Bible says. It's not going to be on the screen, but listen to what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 through 28. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Think about it. Every problem we've got, one way or another, it ends at death, but not sin. Because the Bible says that it is appointed unto man once to die, and after death, the judgment. So the good news is that while Jesus doesn't deal with every problem we've got, he doesn't answer every question we raise. He doesn't smooth every road that is rocky. The good news is he deals with our greatest problem. He meets our greatest need. He answers our biggest question. And that is good news. But not only that, we also see something else that the angel said. He doesn't just say, I bring you good tidings of great joy. I bring you good news. He says, that will be for all the people. All people are beneficiaries of this news. Now listen, think back for a second to where we started in this series. Way back, first Sunday after Thanksgiving, we didn't start in a stable, we started in a garden. We didn't start with Mary and Joseph, we started with Adam and Eve. And in Genesis 1 and 2, we saw a world none of us have ever seen before, right? We saw a world free 
from sin, from curse, sickness, sorrow, and death. That was the world created in the first pages of the Bible. But then in Genesis 3, we saw another world. A world that was cursed. A world that was full of sin and sorrow and brokenness and death. And that is the world that you and I woke up in this morning. But that's not the normal world. That's not the norm as God created it. But the problem is, when you stay from the normal so long, the abnormal becomes normal. And you begin to think that the messed up stuff is just normal the way that it is. Let me give you an illustration. A lot of you all know, for some reason, back around Thanksgiving, I started having problems with my left eye. Eye works fine. I can see great. Everything's fine. But it's just kind of drooping a little bit. Been to the doctor, getting an appointment for someplace down at Nashville. I've got something called ptosis. Literally, the eyelid muscle has just become detached. That's why it is the way that it is. Every morning for weeks after it started happening, here's what I would do. I would wake up, I would go to the mirror, and I would look at my eye. And here's what I always thought every morning. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's looking better. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's good. Yeah, still see. Yeah, getting better. Until I went from looking at my left eye to my right eye. Oh, yeah. It's not good. It's not getting better. See, I thought the abnormal was getting better until I saw the normal. So now when I wake up in the morning, I don't look at the left eye first. I look at the right eye. Then I look at the left eye and I say, yep, still the same. The problem is still there. Well, listen, folks. The world that you and I live in is not the world that God created And it is not the world that we are created for. We are created for a different world, a better world. But the Bible says that this good news will be for all the people. Now, here's something absolutely amazing. The very fact that the angel is delivering this news to the shepherds really emphasizes this point. In the days of Jesus, in Bible times, in the culture, in the place, in the period in which they lived, shepherds were considered to be the lowest of the low. It was a job you took because literally you could not do anything else. No one thought highly of shepherds. Everyone thought low of them. In fact, shepherds were thought so low of that their testimony was not even admissible in a court of law. If you had a case to go to trial and you had a shepherd as a witness, you had no witness. They would not even be uh, sworn in under oath to say, I saw the whole thing. But here's something interesting. The Bible says in verse 16 and 18 of our text, And they, the shepherds, went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds had told them. These men who could not testify in a human court are now made witnesses to the birth of Jesus. But it gets even better. When you go further into the New Testament, like right now, we're talking birth of Jesus, right? Well, in a few months, we're going to be talking about death and resurrection of Jesus. And not only were the shepherds' witness accounts inadmissible in a court of law, someone else who couldn't testify, women. Women could not be witnesses in a court of law at this time. And the Bible says in Matthew 28, verse 5 through 7, But the angel said to the women, 
Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. They're not even, a, it's not that they're just being permitted to testify. They're being commissioned. You go and you tell the disciples what you have seen and what you have heard. Understand something. When it comes to Jesus, when it comes to his people, when it comes to being saved, it does not matter if you are rich or poor, Ph.D. or G.E.D. Doesn't matter if you live in a mansion or a trailer park. Doesn't matter your gender. Doesn't matter your culture. Doesn't matter your country. Doesn't matter your color. Doesn't matter your mom, your dad, your prison record. None of that matters because Jesus is good news for all people. Every person has the ability and the potential to benefit from this good news. Jesus makes sons and daughters of all of us. And that is the good news for all the people. So we've got good news. We've got good news for all people. And finally, we've got good news to hold on to. Now, let me just kind of tell you something real quick. This might be boring, but I promise you it's pretty cool. Luke was not a disciple. All right, Luke was not a disciple. He, he wasn't in the upper room. He, he, he didn't listen to the Sermon on the Mount. G, uh, Luke was a doctor. He was a physician, and he was a co-laborer in the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, and he also wrote the Acts of the Epistles. Luke was a historian. And as a historian, Luke went and gathered intel on everything he was writing. He talked to people who were there. He talked to witnesses. He gathered his report. He wrote Luke, and he wrote the Acts of the Apostles. In fact, there was once a, 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 his, a, an archaeologist, a guy by the name of Sir William Ramsay. And he was one of the greatest archaeologists to ever live. He was a student of the German historical school, which taught that the book of Acts was a product of the mid-2nd century and not of the 1st century, as it purports to be. So in his research on the history of Asia Minor, Ramsey paid little attention to the New Testament. His investigations, however, eventually compelled him to consider the writings of Luke, the author of the book of Acts. The archaeologist observed the meticulous accuracy of the historical details and gradually his attitude towards this book began to change. And he was forced to conclude, here's what he says, Luke is a historian of the first rank. This author should be placed along the very greatest of historians. So as a historian, what did Luke do? He talked to people. And one of the people he talked to was Mary, the mother of Jesus. And what does Mary say in verse 19 of the text? But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. Mary plays a big role, doesn't she? I mean, she carried the baby Jesus to term in her womb and delivered him. Mary plays a big role. But if you read in the gospel accounts, Mary just kind of got information on a need-to-know basis. There were things that she learned all through the life of Jesus and even after the life of Jesus. What started in Mary on this Christmas day more than 2,000 years ago was not her reaching or crossing the finish line. It was literally just the starting pistol. She treasured up these things. She pondered them in her heart. She grew from this day forward. That first Christmas... 
had an absolutely unbelievable effect on Mary. It had an effect on the shepherds, on Joseph, the wise men. For bad, it had an effect on King Herod. Christmas has an amazing, glorious effect. And it affects people literally all over the world and has for centuries. But the question that I have for you today, while it has affected all these people, has it affected you? Have you had this Christmas moment? Have you, it's not just that you know the good news. Look, I dare say that a lot of you just by rote memorization could have quoted the verses that we read from Luke 2. And probably even more of the Luke 2 story. You know the good news. Do you believe the good news? That while every problem of yours cannot be solved here today, your biggest problem, the problem of sin, can be solved and was solved more than 2,000 years ago. Has Christ, has Christmas, had an effect on you? Today is the day to get things right. Today is the day not just to know about Jesus, but to know Jesus. Today is the day for you to come and receive this good news. Will you come today? I want to ask our song leader, if he would, to make his way forward, our musicians, everyone who has a part in the invitation. Everyone who has a part in the invitation is up either on stage or making their way to stage. Do you have a part in this invitation? This invitation is extended to any and everyone. The invitation to come, to come to Jesus, the bringer of good news, and receive the good news that he has for you. Will you come today? I don't know about this. I don't know about that. You know, preacher, I'm struggling with this. Can I let you in on something? I'm probably right there with you. There are many things, Billy Graham said this, there are many things about God that I do not understand or comprehend. But I accept his revelation of himself by faith. Kyle, I don't know about this. I don't know about that. I don't either. But here's what I do know. That by his wounds, I have been healed. That's what I know. Do you know that today? Father, bless this time of response. Use it for today. May Christmas affect many in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together.